Our first speaker is Dr. Phil Milhouse. Dr. Milhouse has been a friend, a volunteer, a professional consultant, and a lead investigator on seven archaeological surveys for JDCF properties. Phil got his undergrad degree at uh, Beloit College in Wisconsin in anthropology and history, and then his master's and PhD from U of I in Illinois, uh, finalizing his PhD work there in 2012. He then started, actually while he was a student, he started working for the Illinois uh, Archaeological Survey, which is state-run survey, and he worked there from 2006 to 2014. In 2014, he made a big change. He stopped working for the State Archaeological Society and started his own consulting business called Redgates Archaeology, named for the farm his family owns on Redgates Road in Galena. Uh, this is a big change for Phil, and it's taken him in, into some directions which he's really happy to be working in. And so now he's working with tribal groups in Wisconsin and Illinois to uh, serve on their behalf as an archaeologist to help them discover their heritage and their past. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Phil Milhouse. Um, before Phil starts, I just want to set the context for the morning on where Phil and Tim Horsley and Leslie Drain will be speaking about. And um, so we are, oh, go to the, um, oh, here we go. We are located right up here right now. Um, this is Route 84 that you came in on. So Village of Hanover is up here. Uh, the school we're in is right here. And just down the road is our Wapello uh, Land and Water Reserve. And we made an addition here a couple of years ago. And then this is the Apple River right here. So I want to set this context for you because they're going to be using a lot of different name places. Um, they'll be talking about the Wapello Land and Water Reserve. They'll be talking about the John Chapman archaeological site, named after a landowner. It's just how we named archaeological sites back in the day. This is John Chapman on the original Wapello Land and Water Reserve. On the addition down here is the Grace Chapman, John's wife, um, archaeological site. And then across the river is our Oneota Preserve. And so when they're talking about Wapello, John Chapman, Grace Chapman, Oneota, I want you to think about your own, you're within almost a stone's throw of, the, of these places that they'll be talking about and where we've discovered some very rich archaeological and cultural history. What I want to do today is run through a kind of very general presentation of kind of work focused on the Grace Chapman site, which is the archaeological site that is in the new Wapalo edition, which is largely a terminal woodland site. Um, there will be follow-up to that by Dr. Tim Horsley on geophysical work there, and then Leslie Drain will be talking about the Grace, or the John Chapman, see I'm confusing myself, site to the north, which is a, largely a Mississippian-related site. But I'll be focusing on Grace Chapman. And this will be, I'll keep it very general. We'll hopefully have some time at the end for questions. If I say something extremely confusing, raise your hand and, and interrupt me, because that's, that does happen. Um, what, something I want to say before I start, I've said this at other presentations, so suffer through if you've heard this before, is that I was joking yesterday with Steve that they put the archaeologists in the morning so that then in the afternoon we can have Native American speakers who can discuss the truth and set everybody straight. And, and, and kind of off of that, what I want to mention going into this before any of us talk is, is we're going to throw out this word culture a lot. Woodland culture, Mississippian culture, Ho-Chunk culture, Sock and Fox, Meskwaki culture. We're going to use this big C, little C word a lot. And I just want to, want to kind of point out that when archaeologists talk about culture, it's completely artificial and made up. It's fairy tale. 
It really is. I mean, that's what we do. We create stories off very small and discrete pieces of evidence. So what we're doing is we're taking bits of pottery and bits of stone tools and trying to assemblage chronologies and how people lived on a landscape and, and create histories that way and create chronologies of when people were on the landscape. And so when we talk about archaic and woodland and effigy mound culture and use these different terms rather flippantly often, um, this is a construction that we have made so that we can communicate with each other across regions and states and figure out what's going on through time. What it is not, it is, it is not really culture in the way people like, like Kay or Albert or Chloris are going to speak about culture, which is this, this living thing that people are embodying as they go through life and how they, how they see the world and, and their religious practices and what they do you know, when, they, when, they, when a relative is deceased, and all, the, all these different practices that constitute someone's culture, which we all have. So those are two very different things. And as we shift from, from the morning presentations to the afternoon presentations, just take that into account. That it's, it's, it's a different way of looking at culture. Nobody out here at these village sites walked out of their, you know, their structures in the morning holding up a pot, decorated in some way, saying, I'm a woodland or I'm a Mississippian, like no one did that. Those are just terms that we've created so we can, we can understand each other and try to, try to figure out what's going on. So Joe Davies County, most of you I assume are residents or your regional residents, is extremely rich in archeological remains of Native American groups and cultures that, that were in this area for thousands and thousands of years. And once you're know what to look for, which takes about five minutes, or many of you already know what to look for. You grew up on farms, you, you, you saw this material. It is literally everywhere. Any fields everywhere are scattered with stone tools, arrowheads, spearheads, knives, rock shelters with long occupations, and then areas over that bluff tops, bluff ridges are full of burial mounds where ancestors were placed that looked over where living generations continued to be. And that, that's all over, all over the county. And it's all up and down the Mississippi River Valley. And so, but there are some areas, especially this area, where, where there's much more of those remains than, than other places. So it was, it was, it was a special place. And, and I kind of got to know this material growing up here. Um, as I tell people, I was so geeky and so nerdy that when the weekend came and everybody's out road drinking, partying, and doing all these things, I was going over topo maps and hiking bluffs and looking for mounds and, you know, looking for village sites. And I mean, I was I was a real nerd. But it gave me a real early on feel and understanding for how extensive these remains were and and what was actually here. But we want to kind of pull back from the whole county and kind of look at, oh, I got a pointer. We're going to focus here. There's a topographic map. This is Lower Apple River Valley. A whole series of sites here that are woodland and Mississippian related. Um, there were woodland cultures here for thousands of years responsible for many of the burial mound groups, many of the effigy mound groups. And there's evidence that when you get to 900, 1,000 AD, you know, say, several thousand years ago, you, there, were, there were problems and difficulties that woodland societies were feeling throughout the Midwest. And there were various responses through different regions to how to deal with those. One of those in the South was uh, another culture arose, again, we're using archeology span term for culture, referred to as Mississippian, which was very radically different from what had come before. Large planned towns, hereditary elites, lots of intensive cultivation of maize or corn, and, and a lot of different ideas about, about religion, the way the world is established. And what you see in, when you go, let me just go back here. What you see is, is there's a huge center. Most of you are aware of the Cahokia site near St. Louis. Huge urban center that was a Mississippian center that arose in that area. And if you haven't been there, please go see that site. It's a park now. You can climb the largest mound, Monk's Mound, and look over the St. Louis Arch. It was a huge city. Um, there, and there were a number of satellite cities, Mississippian cities in that area. Uh, if you want to read about it, any books by Tim Pocatat, Susan Alt, Sarah Barris, 
work by Melissa Baltus, some of these scholars now that are dealing with Cahokia are really informative. But this was an enormous radical departure from what had happened here before, and it had a huge impact throughout the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes region. We're not totally sure the mechanism of that. Were people moving, migrating, bringing these ideas? Were the ideas moving through the Midwest as people were adapting to these changes or these difficult times? Or were both things going on? Um, we're, not ex we're not exactly clear, but what we do know that it, here, along the Apple River Valley, there's a whole series of sites that are, look like Mississippian sites. Um, pioneer archaeologist uh, William Nickerson, who worked in the Hanover and Galena area in the 1800s, he was a railroad worker, he picked this up right away. He puts in his, one of his reports to Peabody, these sites along the Apple River have a southern flair to them. They look like something that's farther down the Mississippi. They don't quite belong here. He, he realized that. And, and so you have a series of these sites, small, looks like small farming sites, as well as villages or town sites where you have platform mounds and it looks like you may have, you may have plaza arrangements, a very different configuration from how woodland people had, had their villages across the landscape for thousands of years. This is, this is one of those sites of back in 1998, that's, that's what Wapalo looked like in 98. Local collectors were well aware of these Mississippian sites, having picked up conch shell, beads, Cahokia pottery, hose from southern Illinois, material. And we did some work there in 2003 to help, help kind of identify what was at that site to make an argument for preservation, including a little geophysics on, on the mound where collectors had picked up these marine shell beads for years. But I will not really go into the John Chapman site at the original Wapalo Preserve, as Leslie will be dealing with that in another presentation. What I want to focus on here is the Grace Chapman Mound Group, which is on the property to the south. And what that was, was originally it was, it was recorded by T.H. Lewis, who was an early surveyor who mapped thousands of mounds. Okay, there we go. Now I can, now I can pace and can you can you hear me? Okay, all right, all right. So I'll focus on on this this mound group that the T. H. Lewis had, had mapped and, and originally mapped it in 1888 and he published it in a small article in Science and he recorded that there were when you look out there now on on that Wapolo edition it's a field and it's been cultivated heavily. And there are just several bumps which are obviously remnants of these mounds. And, and there has been geophysic work with Dr. Horsley we'll talk about later pertaining to some of those mounds. But when Lewis was out there in 1888, he records 38 mounds. Like this is a big group. There are you know, as many mounds out there as there are at say the Portage site. And they included linears, conicals, conicals with ramps, and then what he called this bulky animal which appears to be a bear effigy. So he recorded that, that mound, and then several decades later, in 1926-27, the University of Chicago came to this area. They had established an anthropology department. They were going to systematically survey and excavate across Illinois, from Joe Davies to Cook, and go back and forth on the county. So they started here, and it was the first archaeological work that the department had actually done. So they came to this area. And they started work at Portage, but they also met with T.D. Shipton, who was a local collector, and he brought them out to, to the Grace Chapman Mounds. And even then, in their field notes, Paul Martin records that they're, they're so plowed down within those several decades that it was hard to make them out. Um, but they decided to do work there. And remember, this is before there was any burial mound legislation. Nobody objected to this, except for Native American groups brought up this issue, but nobody paid attention, nobody listened. So whether it was local looters or archeologists, digging and excavating into mounds is what people did with no, with no concern whatsoever. And, and so, so they immediately picked out several of these mounds and they, they excavated trenches into them. They did this in 1926, they did this in 1927. I went through the field notes 
It was the first work they'd done. It was before they had the accumulated material of W.B. Nickerson to use as a guide to develop better methods. So they're very, very cursory. Profile drawings with no soil layers. Um, the students must have had a quota on their field notebooks because it's filled with all kinds of college student filler. You know, it's not really very informative. Um, but, and they recorded that in these trenches, they located no burials in these mounds which was really common at that time, and eventually it, it, it has come back to, to haunt preservationists, most recently in Wisconsin, where people have pulled out these old reports and say there's no burials there, so you can't really say these are burials, so we can develop, we can quarry, we can do X, Y, and Z, because unless you excavate and prove their burials, thus destroying them, you can't say it is. What, what probably likely happened was that, that through decomposition in different soils, through cremation which went on, or different burial practices, they may have been missed. And or if you're just trenching through a mound, you may not have hit them. So to just automatically say, because an old report said we didn't find burials means none were there, that's, it's not, that's questionable. But one of the interesting things about the, the write-up of this, this, uh, this work is that they talk about at the base of the mounds were these great big pits that were filled with refuse. Deer bones, fish bones, clam shells or mussel shells, pottery, arrow points, all this kind of material. And, and they, they couldn't quite make sense of that. It didn't fit into what they knew about mounds. And these are a couple images of the University of Chicago work. I, this is an elderly gentleman, and I know he was not a Chicago graduate or undergraduate student. And I'm wondering if he's TD Shipton. I don't know. If anybody in the Hanover community has pictures of him, uh, please let me know. But these are some of these pits that they excavated at the base of the mound. Um, you can see one well there. And these are some of the middens of garbage or debris which, uh, which they were looking at. These are old photos from, from the 1920s. And they were trying to comprehend what was going on. What these are is their refuse pits, which was common. Leslie will mention these dealing with, with John Chapman's site. Tim will mention it with his geophysics. People would dig these pits in village or residential areas, store corn, store things in them. If they became too eroded, too infested, whatever, they would be cleaned out and then they would be used for refuse, which is great for archeologists because they contain all this incredible material that we can use. So, I mean, that's what we do. We look at other people's garbage, in essence. That's, that's our career. And, and in, this, in, this, um, in these pits were, 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 were the, these ceramics. These are some examples from, from, uh, from Grace Chapman, which, which looked like effigy mound pottery, but it was Madison ware, but it was a little bit different. It didn't quite look like the Mississippian material University of Chicago was finding just over the field. Uh, the fence to the north at John Chapman. So they didn't quite know what to make of it or where to, where to put that. Um, and at that time, a lot of archaeology was focused on chronology building and trying to get a sequence of cultures, again, archaeological cultures, to understand occupation in areas over time. And a lot of this was scientifically driven. Some of it was ego driven. People wanted to name phases and cultures and and pottery styles, because then even if they're wrong, they're cited forever. Um, it's, it's a good way to, to, to be immortal, is to name things. And so, so there was a lot of time spent getting material remains and creating, creating phases or focuses or ways to kind of define, define them. And when John Bennett, later in the 40s, took some of Nickerson's work, the University of Chicago work, and kind of summarized it in a dissertation, he created something called the Chapman Focus, which he said was what these mounds represented or the material out of these pits from the site was the transition between Middle Woodland Hopewell, which are the people that built Gramercy Park, portage some of these large conical mounds, and the later effigy mound cultures that came later. We now know from looking at these ceramics and comparing them with other sites that it's actually on the opposite end of the spectrum. It's at the, it's at the end of effigy mound culture when we begin to see these kind of corded, collared ceramics appearing. And these are some examples of, 
of, of this material. Those are actually sherds that were excavated in the 1920s. This material was, had vanished for a long period of time. And a couple years ago, when I went down to ISM, they're like, some college in the Midwest had recently turned a bunch of material over to them that a, a, a long retired professor had like in a storage closet. And in it was all the material from the Grace Chapman Mounds. Because that was a time when a lot of collection agreements in museums, they were good old boy agreements, shaking hands over drinks. I'll give you this stuff, you want to work it up, and you give me this and that. Well, there wasn't a lot of paperwork involved, and a lot of times stuff never, never went back where it was, I'm sure this is a large part of your life, <laughs> is, is dealing with this issue. Well, anyway, somehow this stuff was discovered and, and sent to Illinois State Museum. So now we actually can look at the, these shirts um, that, that were found from, from these pits. These are some other, other examples. These are, these are deceptive shirts. When you look at them compared to Anasazi pottery or, or some Mississippian pottery, people will be like, it looks boring or bland or simplified. And like I said, it's, check my time here so we're not here till noon. Um, it, uh, it's deceptive because a lot of these, a lot of these cord and pressed vessels, it was actually kind of woven, very intricate collars that would have been hundreds and hundreds of hours of labor that were impressed on some of these ceramics. So, so when you look at them, again, they're brown, they have these designs on it, it looks simple, it's not. It's actually the end result of a very long and complicated, complicated labor process. So I'm kind of trying to work through the University of Chicago material now. It's difficult because of the field notes and, the, and trying to correlate that with what we have in the artifact material. But when, when JDCF actually purchased the property that those mounds sat on, we had an opportunity to investigate further or to look, you know, look, at, it, look at it today and try to figure out what this site is all about. And so what we did is it was cultivated and we did a public archaeology survey, which I know some of you particip participated in, probably will never do archaeology again, because it was cold, it was wet, it was muddy, it was miserable, and we had all those kids out from different school groups, and it was, it was a madhouse, it was fun, it was great, and we got good information, but I, I know some people were, were it, was, it was a trial. So we had all these students out there, and what we were able to figure out by walking back and forth over this field, not really figure out, but verify, because you talk to local collectors and they're like, well, there's tons of material out there. It's not just those plowed down mounds. It's, there's, there's a lot of material there. Is that that's exactly true. There's, there's a, a really large, very dense village or habitation site there. Largely, it appears to be terminal woodland, the end of the woodland period, which is important because that, those were the local people that were here and understanding what happened when Mississippian ideas or people moved into this area for both. We need to know what was here first. And so we were able to look at that. It was also clear from these collections that the occupation is old. It goes back thousands of years. There's other earlier woodland material. There's archaic material. It was occupied over and over and over a long period of time. Steve mentioned the story last night. I will, so I will, I will tell you the Jonathan James story, which is just one of the, one of the aspects of the surface survey we did. This young gentleman was in one of these lines. You have to systematically walk the surface. You put flags down where you find stuff, and then you can see distributions and go back and collect, collect that material. And you have to do it systematically. Everybody has to stay together. It's kind of military. Because somebody gets too fast and too slow, and pretty soon it all breaks down and nothing works. And, and it, it's haphazard, and you're not going to be able to collect good information that way. Everybody was doing great. The Elizabeth teachers were, they're very Germanic. They, they had those kids like lined up and orderly and they kept them in line. It was, it was fantastic. This guy was way behind because he kept breaking apart all these pieces of dirt. He would stop and break them apart. And they were kind of riding. Keep going. Like you're gonna, you're holding things up. We need to finish this section and get on to the next section. And he's like, but I want to find something. They're like, no, you're done. I'm just, Look at the surface. You don't break everything apart. And he picked up this one last pot of dirt and broke it apart. And there's an 11,000 year old projectile for you right in the middle. And he showed his teacher. He's like, "Is this something?" <laughs> I don't know if he's. I don't know if he was being smart or not. But uh, and and it was an 11,000 year old projectile. Point. It's a late Paleo Indian 
projectile point. So we have long occupation on, on this terrace, and his diligence paid off because that's the oldest piece of material we have from any jades yet preserved in the county. Um, and there's undoubtedly Paleo Indian sites out there hidden. We don't know about them, but but this as far as as far as finding one, and that was due to his his perseverance. So. These are just some, some pictures of other, there's that point, there's that late Paleo-Indian point. This is an early archaic point, so we're into 9,000, 500, 8,000 years ago, you know, coming into, into the middle archaic time period. And then if we carry on, we get all the way down to these small arrow points which came in at the end of the woodland period, we're talking 8,900, 1,000 AD. And then this particular shirt, you'll recognize this because I already showed pictures of these. But this is uh, this is terminal terminal woodland ceramics. So there's a dense village out there, and there's a mound group on top of it, and which is very interesting. I won't go into layouts and community structure. That's Dr. Horsley's problem. Um, but anyway, later that was followed up by these characters. There's. Tim, there's uh, Richard Spear, um, doing geophysic work at the site. And like I said, I won't say anything more about that because I'll leave that to them to clarify what they found over several seasons. So this is, a, this is just a topographic map that shows this little section of the Lower Apple River Valley. Here's the original Wapolo Preserve with the John Chapman site, the later Mississippian site that Leslie will talk about. Here is the Grace Chapman site right here and in the Wapalo addition along with several others. This is the Eagle's Nest property, a whole series of archaeological sites on there. And recently, as Steve mentioned, GDCF has acquired this large parcel directly across the river, which is the Oneota Preserve. And so we were able to be out there with the friends group. I guess they didn't learn from the first time. Some of them came back to do this work again and we did kind of a systematic survey over portions of that property as well. We have similar, similar kind of material. This is an early archaic point, a Fox Valley point, named after the Fox Valley in Illinois, probably 8,000, 8,500 years ago. We moved through a woodland sequence. These are, these are woodland projectile points, arrow points, much later. This is actually the aerial this shows that site boundary. Those are all archaeological sites. So what we have is, with all these properties, is, is a whole series of sites, very dense amount of sites, that cover the whole gamut of Native American occupation across this region. These bluffs, as any of you know who live here, are just covered with burial mound groups that overlook those sites. So this is, this is extremely important. Um, I'll kind of wrap up here now that I've, I've mentioned, uh, mentioned Oneota and this kind of larger landscape. And what's unique about, about that, what's going on here, you could say, well, anywhere you go in the Mississippi River Valley is rich archeologically, or, or we have a, a sequence along history of cultures. But what's really neat about this area and unique is that because of Hanover Bluffs, IDNR, the work of JDCF in putting together these large parcels and preserving them is that you're getting to preserve these long stories and these series of sites over time and these burial mound groups that overlook those sites. And, and that's rare. Um, usually, as I mentioned before, you go to a park with mounds, it's, it's, it's a little parcel with a grassy knoll, or you go to a nature preserve or a state park a lot of times, and like, there happen to be mounds in there and they happen to deal with them, but it's not really a focus. Here, this is part of the focus, of not just preserving these landscapes with their natural element, but this long Native American history, and we have that story preserved, uh, and which is really fascinating, and it's, it's not something that you see happen very often has to be commended. Um, I'll, I'll, the last thing I'll say is kind of what I always wrap up any of these kind of general presentations with is I want people to kind of walk away with realizing kind of the importance that, that understanding what went on here has. Because 
a lot of times, especially as an archaeologist and anybody who has and is in a field like this or art or anything, people are always like, so what? What's the use? Why should I support this? Why should my tax dollars support it? Why should I donate to this? You know, what, what good is this for us? I mean, it's a valid question. Um, and, and, and my answer with archaeology is usually comes across several points. One of them, one of them is that it, it is one way to address and to understand the native heritage that came before us. Um, we can't go back and fix the atrocities and, and the awful things that went on in the past and continue to go on today, as, as Chief Rose talked about. This just kind of struggle to do basic, basic survival for your community. So it's, it's a way to, to make that, that long breath of that heritage known to be appreciated and be respected and give people, you know, legitimate claim and place. Yes, we were here. This is still here. We preserved this. And it's a way to, to, to show some respect um, to, to these communities that are still here. Kind of stepping back into the bigger picture, I like to tell people that you know, we, we look around today, we turn on the news, most people don't turn on the news anymore because it sends them into depression. And, and there's a lot of serious, serious problems that we're confronting, um, whether it's um, unequal resources, whether it's poverty, whether it's ethnic and racial and national conflict, whether it's war, whether it's how do we deal with what's happening with the environment. Um, unequal opportunities. These are all problems that we face, but they're not new. They're not new at all. They're, they're problems humans have faced, all our ancestors have faced over and over and over again. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel to figure that out these solutions and to work out of these problems. Because we have to work out of them if we're going to survive. Because now they're not regional or local or valley. They're, they're global. If we don't figure it out, we're in trouble. But we have we have these books on the shelf that explain how to do this, or how not to do this, and that's the archaeological record. It's an incredible record of, we have here thousands of years of people living on a landscape successfully without destroying it and themselves. What can we learn from that? There are also times when things did not work well. We can learn from that. So we actually, we have the solutions to these problems, in, in the past, and what our ancestors did. They did something, because we're all here, right? We're not, we're not part of an extinct fossil record, not yet. So, so that's my kind of answer to the bigger question of what, what knowing this can do, is it can give, by really trying to understand it, it can give us a way to step back and look at the things, the problems we face now, and not go into hysteria, and, and the sky's falling, and this, we can't solve this problem, we can't. Our ancestors solved them. We can solve them. We just have to scale it out larger and do that. So what JDCF is doing is not just preserving trivia and, and esoteric knowledge about artifacts and potsherds and arrow points, but it's a record of, of native cultures and it's something that we can learn from and actually apply today for what we're dealing with as well. And I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions. Yes. So, uh, we've got daily a point that was found. It makes me uh, think that it must have been with some discontinuities. It's a generation is 25 years. 500 generations of Native Americans living on that land before the first white set foot in Joe Davis County. At least, yeah, at least. Uh, you know, er, earliest occupation is a is a is a is a really touchy subject. Archaeologists argue and fight about it. When were the first people here? Very conservative archaeologists will say if you have Clovis or late, those are the first people. Um, Native American accounts often project that time of origin or occupation much earlier. Archaeologists often scoffed at that legends and myths and fairy tales and all this kind of stuff. But as we do more and more work in South America and, and 
and along the coast of the west, that occupation is actually getting pushed back further and further. So we're having to eat crow on that. So at least for here and what we have at this site, yes. Yeah. And I always tell people, pull up a ruler, just a 12 inch ruler, you know, look at, look at the, the last few little marks on it. That, that's US history, all the rest of that ruler. 12,000 years, 15,000, whatever you want to say, that's, that's native history. I mean, we've been here just, uh, just for a little while. Eight generations. Yeah, and it's very short. Yeah. Um, I remember hearing that up around Sun Prairie in Wisconsin, they found uh, mammoth bones. Have, have you found any interesting uh, animal bones around here? Yeah. I believe there's, is it here, the mammoth tooth? Okay, okay, yeah, so they show up, um, they've been plowed out of fields, so around here, yeah, we get places to see animals. If you go back and read old newspaper accounts, a lot of times miners digging into crevices, especially the ones that go in off the bluffs, you know, report, you know, giant peccaries, huge elephant, but they're obviously finding Pleistocene remains that are filtered into these crevices from above, so they're here. Yeah. whole thing. Are they all a little over 90, Steve? You probably know exactly. The total grouping there is about 558. Okay. All right. I should know. I've like paced across all of it. <laughs> yeah. Is there a picture you have up there for the birds? Is there a story behind that? That is, um, that's a peregrine falcon, and, and some of you know falcons as diving birds, and they knock their prey out of the sky, and, and, and the peregrine has this forked motif on its eyes, and, and Mississippian people would oftentimes, you see in artwork, that they have that motif on, on people's hats as warriors. They, they would use that motif. But there are also ceramic images, either carved in ceramics or corded in, of, of people as, you know, as peregrine falcons or taking the power of that peregrine falcon to use. And when you looked at those cord impressed ceramics from the mounds, you could see those nested triangles. Many people interpret that as a symbol or a simplified symbol of that falcon motif, that upper world motif. Um, whether that's the case or not, I, you know, I won't say for certain. You know, it's just, it's, it's something that, that that may be the case given where they're presented and how the kind of history of that decoration goes. Yeah. Right now, the stuff that's went through the surveys that I'm writing up, like I have and I'm going through. As they go into land and water reserve, that will be, they will be transferred to the Illinois State Museum. And, and that's where they'll be curated, like finally. By law, I think material from land and water reserve has to end up there. Um, and, and some of it, you know, I, I waited a few years on a couple of things because they shut the State Museum down and we're divesting of collections. So I didn't know what would happen. Now they're up and running and then they will accept stuff again. And as far as, as, far as collections and, and nations today, a lot of the, especially anything NAGPRA related, is related to, to, to funerary items, burial items related to skeletal material or where groups want, want to make claim um, on those. I mean, the surface material, um, from, from this stuff will probably stay at the museum, although, you know, I suggest, I would, I would think, if it's coming from actual mound groups, groups could make claims if they wanted to, say, this, this is actually related to a, a burial mound group, we want to look at this, we would like to, you know, have possession of it. Yeah. Have you noticed the correlation between, say, mounds and mounds You're asking if there's correlations between Cahokia and the satellite communities in here, uh, on the outer river. So, uh, 
down in Cambodia, there are many uh, war sites that have been done. Yeah. And were they paleo and then go through the same process as they did here? There's a, there's a similar cultural sequence in the American bottom. I, I say similar. I mean, it, 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 in the broadest sense, but you know, kind of how communities were laid out, different changes and things that went on over time are different. Obviously, there's a little different time frame. But the sites here with the platform mounds are definitely related in some way to what was going on with Kofi and those Mississippian sites. You see it, and, and Leslie will probably touch on this, you see very different community kind of layouts. And if you look at the mill site, which is another Mississippian site down the river, you see a big platform mound, um, and then you see this conical mound. They're gone now, but they were there and mapped early. You see that in Kokia's main plaza. There's a big platform now and there's a pair of conical now across from that. It, it, it's like a little model. And so there's definitely connections there. So go or read through. Uh, one more question. One more question. All right. The aspects of the mind that a written language was there recorded. Have you found any evidence of written language in any of the explanations? We haven't. Um, whether there was something like in Ashtabeg or Ojibwe did with, with some of the scroll writing and things, we don't know because it would be, per it'd be perishable and organic and gone. Um, but at least as far as on, on you know, ceramics or stone tools, we don't. But that's, again, we only have a fragment of the record. We have what survives. We don't, you know, as far as anything on hides, burst scrolls, anything else, we don't have. 